Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome to English 454. This is lecture 28 and we are starting TSA today. In the last lecture we discussed Matthew Arnold and his uh, function of poetry as well as uh, the limitations that he had as critic. Uh, people have been criticizing Arnold a lot uh, based on the fact that he uh, himself uh, professed that a critic had to be disinterested. But this is not something that he practices himself. Uh, he himself is a very interested critic. He has his own prejudices, he has his biases, he has his likes and dislikes and he practices them. He in, he let the those biases and those dis those likes and dislikes influence his own decision. The disinterestedness according to Eliot was supposedly the best point a critic could have uh, was not one of his uh, biggest assets. Second uh, thing that uh, people have to criticize him about is that he was not a great scholar. His scholarship was always under question whether he was th that good a scholar or a linguist for that matter. کیونکہ uh, اس کے بارے میں کہا جاتا ہے کہ وہ جتنی زبانوں کو ڈسکس کرتا ہے جتنے لٹریچر کو ڈسکس کرتا ہے اس پہ اس کی گرپ نہیں تھی ہی ڈنٹ ہیو دا ساؤنڈ اینڈ دا پروفاؤنڈ اینڈ دا ڈیپتھ آف نالج فار ڈسکسنگ لٹریچر آف دیٹ کائنڈ آف لینگویج ڈسکسنگ لینگویج آف دوز کائنڈ وچ ہی ڈنٹ نو ہے اینڈ آن آن وچ ہی ڈنٹ ہیو اینی ماسٹری ٹھیک ہے اچھا تیسری چیز جو ہے جو اس پہ کرٹیسزم کیا جاتا ہے آنل پہ وہ یہ ہے کہ میتھیو آنلڈ واز اے پوئٹ انیشلی اینڈ ہی واز اے رومانٹک پوئٹ ان ٹریڈیشن آف کیٹس ٹھیک ہے کی کیٹس واز ہز انسپریشن ٹوڈ دا مڈل آف ہز لائف ہی ڈسائڈیڈ ٹو ٹرن اوے فرام رومانٹسزم اینڈ ہی ٹرن ہی ٹوک ٹوک یو ٹرن اینڈ ہی ٹرن کلاسک اور پھر اس بیس پہ اس نے ہر چیز کو اسیس کرنا شروع کیا اینڈ ہی بیگیم ون آف دا اسٹانچسٹ کرٹکس آف رومانٹکس سو دس یو ٹرن ڈز ناٹ گو ان بیکاز جب ہم اس کی پوئٹری کو سیس کرتے ہیں تو پوئٹری از آلویز رومانٹک وچ از ڈز ناٹ اسپیک ان فیور آف اٹ آف وٹ ایور ہی سینگ ایز اے کرٹک نا تو اس کے بارے میں یہ بھی کہا جاتا ہے کہ ہی واز بیٹر بیکاز ہی واز ناٹ دیٹ گڈ اے پوئٹ مے بی دیٹ از وائی ہی ٹرنڈ اگینسٹ دا رومانٹسزم بٹ ہی ہیز ہز پوائنٹس اینڈ ہی اپیئرس ٹو بی یو نو ڈیفینڈنگ دم کوائٹ ویل اچھا پھر اس کے بارے میں یہ بھی کہا جاتا ہے کہ ہی یوز ٹو ہیو دس میتھڈ آف اسیسنگ پوئٹری بیکاز ہی بلیو دیٹ پوئٹری ہیز سچ اے لارج فنکشن سچ اے گریٹ ہیوج فنکشن ٹو پرفارم پوئٹری کا فنکشن کیا تھا اکارڈنگ ٹو ہم دا پوئٹ دا فنکشن آف پوئٹری واز ٹو ٹو گیو دا پیپل این اپریسیشن آف لائف ٹھیک ہے اٹ ہیز ٹو گیو دا اسٹرینتھ اینڈ دا جوائے ٹو پیپل اٹ ہیز ٹو پرووائڈ پلیجر بٹ اٹ ہیز ٹو پرووائڈ ٹروتھ ایز ویل ایٹ دا سیم ٹائم اس کے لیے پوئٹری صرف مورالٹی نہیں تھی اس کے لیے پوئٹری صرف پلیجر نہیں تھا وہ پوئٹری سے یوزفلنیس زیادہ چاہتا تھا پلیجر کا ایلیمنٹ اس کے خیال میں پوئٹری میں تھوڑا سا کم ہونا چاہیے تھا ہی واز اے مورلسٹ ہی ٹریٹڈ پوئٹری لائک اے ریلیجن اینڈ فار ہم اینی تھنگ دیٹ واز اگینسٹ مارلس واز اینی تھنگ دیٹ واز ریوالٹ اگینسٹ مارلس واز ریوالٹ اگینسٹ لائف فار ہیم سر سو دیٹ از بائی اس کی پوئٹری کا جو فنکشن تھا دیٹ واز مورالٹی تو اس نے کہا کہ جو بھی پوئٹری ہوگی اٹ ہیز ٹو ہیو دیز ٹو تھری فیچرس اٹ ہیز ٹو ہیو ٹروتھ اینڈ اٹ ہیز ٹو ہیو ہائی سیریسنیس اٹ ہیز ٹو ہیو ایکسلنس وہ ایکسلنس جو کہ اینشینس کے کاموں میں تھی وہ ایکسلنس وہ کام وہ سیریسنیس وہ ٹروتھ وہ بیوٹی جو اینشینٹ گریکس یا اینشینٹ رائٹرس کی پوئمس میں تھی پوئٹری میں تھی دیٹ از دا اسٹینڈرڈ ہی از لوکنگ فار ان دا ماڈرن ڈے پوئٹری دیٹ از بائی ہی ٹرائز ٹو ڈیفائن اے میتھڈ جس کو وہ ٹچ اسٹون میتھڈ کہتے ہیں اینڈ ہی ڈیفائنس دیٹ میتھڈ اینڈ ان دیٹ میتھڈ ہی ٹرائز ٹو اسیس دا ماڈرن پوئٹری بائی کمپیئرنگ اٹ ود دا اینشینس یہ وہی بات ہے جو کلاسز کا تھا کہ کسی بھی چیز کو اسیس کرنے کے لیے اس کی ججمنٹ کرنے کے لیے اس کی کرٹیکل اپریسیشن کرنے کے لیے یو کمپیئر اٹ ود دا ود دا ورک دیٹ ہیز بی ڈن پریویسلی ٹھیک ہے تو اس کیس میں اس کا جو میتھڈ ہے ٹچ اسٹون میتھڈ اس میں اس نے کہا کہ وی ہیو ٹو ریمبر اے نمبر آف لائنس اینڈ دیز نمبر آف لائنس بائی ایوری کائنڈ آف پوئٹ اور ان کا چونکہ وہ ہر قسم کی چیز کو ڈیفائن کر رہے ہوں گے تو ہم ماڈرن پوئٹس کو ماڈرن رائٹرس کو ان کے اگینسٹ جو ہے کمپیئر کریں گے اینڈ دین ویل گیٹ ٹو نو وٹ کائنڈ آف رائٹرس ان کی پھر ہمیں کریٹیکل اپریسیشن مل جائے گی ہی از فرام دا ایرسٹولین اسکول آف تھاٹ ٹھیک ہے اینڈ ہی بلیوس دیٹ دیر ہیز ٹو بی ہائی سیریسنیس اینڈ ٹروتھ ان میٹر اینڈ ان مینر ایز ویل اینڈ ہی آلسو بلیوس دیٹ 
क्रिटिक हैज टू राइज वेल अबव द प्रैक्टिकल व्यू ऑफ थिंग्स तो ये सारी चीज़ें थी जो मैथ्यू आनल प्रोफेस करता था जो उसके ख्याल में जो उसका क्रिटिसिज्म का ओपिनियन था जिसके ख्याल में क्रिटिसिज्म का फंक्शन होना चाहिए था और जो किसी भी क्रिटिक में क्वालिटीज होनी चाहिए थी उसका ख्याल था कि क्रिटिसिज्म इज़ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू इम्प्रूव द टेस्ट ऑफ द पब्लिक बिकॉज पीपल नीड टू लर्न हाउ टू एप्रिशिएट थिंग्स ही बिलीव दे हैज़ टू बी समथिंग आउटसाइड यू प्रेजेंट जो चीज़ आपके बाहर हो कोई एक ऐसा सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल हो आपके अंदर की जजमेंट मैटर नहीं कर रही ही डिड नॉट बिलीव इन द हिस्टोरिकल एस्टिमेट और द पर्सनल एस्टिमेट ही बिलीव दैट देर हैज टू बी समथिंग आउटसाइड यू अ सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल अ सेट ऑफ रूल अ फ्रेमवर्क अ फ्रेम ऑफ रेफरेंस जिसको ले आप और जिसके अगेंस्ट आप चीज़ों को कंपेयर करें तो ये जो सेट ऑफ रेफरेंस था दैट इज दैट वाज हिज डेस्टिनेशन उसके ख्याल में ये जो सेट ऑफ रेफरेंस है ना ये इंसान के टेस्ट को इम्प्रूव करेगा ह्यूमन रेस के टेस्ट को इम्प्रूव करेगा उसको अप्रिसिएशन करना सिखाएगा पोइट्री की लिटरेचर की किसी भी आर्ट फॉर्म की सो फॉर हिम दैट वाज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट अब उसके लिए वॉज ही सक्सेसफुल इन डूइंग इट आई डोंट थिंक सो मैन द क्रिटिक्स डू अग्री विद मी है दैट ही वॉज नॉट मच सक्सेसफुल बिकॉज ही इज ऑलवेज बिन वेरी एबस्ट्रैक्ट ही इज अगेंस्ट सब्जेक्टिविटी बट ही इज सब्जेक्टिव हिमसेल्फ वो कहता है कि ही बिलीव इन द पोइटिक ऑब्जेक्टिव पोइटिक क्वालिटी और पोइटिक एक्सेलेंस ऑफ द एंशियंट बट ही हैज नॉट बीन एबल टू अचीव दैट इन हिज क्रिटिसिजम एज वेल सो उसके बारे में कहा तो ये जाता है कि ही हैज ट्राइड इज बेस्ट लेकिन उसकी जो लिमिटेशन थी बिसाइड्स इवन दो ही हैड अ फ्यू ऑफ देम इवन दो ही वॉज नॉट यू नो ही इज नॉट वेल लाइक्ड बट द टाइम पीरियड ही एग्जिस्टेड इन द टाइम पीरियड वेर ही प्रैक्टिस हिज आर्ट ऑफ क्रिटिसिजम फॉलोड हिम कंप्लीटली इट वॉज लाइक अ सोशल रिफॉर्म ऑफ दैट टाइम एज इफ पीपल वर रेडी टू यू नो फाइंड समथिंग आउट टू बी टोल्ड वॉट टू डू पीपल जस्ट फॉलोड हिम इट वॉज लाइक कि कोई इंतजार कर रहा था कि उनको कोई प्रिंसिपल्स दिए जाए उनको कोई वे दिया जाए उनको कोई गाइडलाइन दी जाए कोई सेट ऑफ रूल्स दिए जाए उसको फॉलो करना शुरू कर दें इट वॉज लाइक कि पीपल वॉन्टेड टू बी टोल्ड वॉट टू डू एग्जैक्टली एंड हाउ दे डेंट वॉन्ट टू यूज देयर ओन माइंड इट वॉज द टाइम पीरियड वेयर थिंग्स हैड टू बी डन इन अ स्पेशल वे सो आनल इज वेरी सक्सेसफुल एज फार इज इस टाइम पीरियड इज कंसर्न कि उसके टाइम पीरियड में हर चीज को बहुत प्रेम और प्रॉपर तरीके से किया जाता था और बिकॉज साइंटिफिक इन्वेंशनस का दौर था साइंटिफिक डिस्कवरीज का दौर था तो वही जो स्पिरिट था वो लिटरेचर में भी आ गया था और इसी वजह से ये जो मैथ्यू आर्नल्ड का टाइम है ना ये इसका बहुत सक्सेसफुल क्रिटिक था मैथ्यू आर्नल्ड की ही ट्रेडिशन में we have another critic and he's one of the most influential very very influential when i say influential i mean influential this time hum coleridge ko bhi influential kehte hain wordsworth ko bhi influential kehte hain hum aristotle ko bhi influential kehte hain aristotle yes influential tha samuel johnson wordsworth coleridge time period ke liye ek era ke liye ek 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 century ke liye khas literary movement ke liye important the influential the um arnold i can't say that he was influential over a period of time a uh, theek hai victorian age mein he was very influential T. S. Eliot, on the other hand, very influential. People believe him. People set their, you know, literary standards according to him. Why he is so influential? We exactly don't know because he hasn't written a book, so-called, on criticism. And he's a traditionalist. He's following the classic trend. He says that things have to be compared against the past. So he bought it. So, बहुत से लोग बहुत ऐसे से कर रहे हैं. लेकिन फिर भी ही इज कंसिडर्ड अमंग द मोस्ट इन्फ्लुएंशियल क्रिटिक्स ऑफ इंग्लिश लिटरेचर अब ही वॉज अ पोइट एज वेल एंड ही वॉज इन्फ्लुएंस बाय ह्यूम्स एंड ही वॉज इन्फ्लुएंस बाई एज रपाउंड इन हिज पोइट्री इसकी पोइट्री इमेजिज्म रियलिज्म ह्यूमनिज्म का इन्फ्लुएंस थी हैंनरी जेम्स का इन्फ्लुएंस था इसकी पोइट्री पे ही यूज टू हैव दिस फ्रेंच पोइट I forgot his name. Lefranje, uh, uski, uski, uh, uska initial influence uska tha, jisne usko sikhaya tha ki how to create a urban settings uh, for his uh, poetry, how to make uh, these characters who have these abstract ironies attached to their personalities, uh, and Henry James ke characters, Henry James ke heroes ki tarah iske characters, jo iski poetry mein characters the, they were all uh, bleak and um, abstract and unhappy. so it was a time period in the initial 1920s 30s humanism ki movement start hui thi uh, american humanism ke theek hai and t s eliot uh, has the limelight now uh, t s eliot believes ke it happens after every 100 years or so that uh, a, a critic comes around theek hai and that critic he just changes the scene he has to come around to put order to things 
to rearrange things, to uh, re to form new opinions about the poets and their poems. It's sort of a re revolution and it's also a readjustment. So, Eliot bhi kisi aise hi time pe hai. Arnold ke baad, Eliot ka aana is like the complete revolution, a complete readjustment of ideas. He brought a new theory. Um, ab it was not new, kyunke iske baare mein jo sabse the ambiguous cheez hai, jo logon ko parashan karti ho ye hai ki Everyone thinks that he is revolutionary. Um, if people find his ideas extremely inspiring. But they can't, you know, put their finger on the fact that what is so revolutionary about him, what is so inspirational about him. People just find it very, very difficult to pinpoint the fact. Eliot believed that every critic uh, 100 year, after 100 years or so has to come and he has to redefine. He has to redefine the conception of criticism and the principles of criticism as well. He is there to uh, set new standards and new rules. And as long as the work has been done, as long as the work has been done, they will be assessed again. They will be categorized again. They will be compartmentalized again. They will compare new set of principles against them. He says this is, this is necessary after 100 years or so. This is necessary because, the pro because of the progression of the uh, human mind, because of the development and evolution of the mankind. Things are changing, society is changing. It is important that taste alter kya jaye. People have different tastes now and things have to be tailored to suit that taste. Uh, us taste ko improve karna bhi kritika kaam hai. Us mein usko uh, sahi cheeze taake wo appreciate kar sake wo taste, taake wo taste jo hai, wo sahi the direction mein ho, ye bhi kritika kaam hai. So he says ki after Matthew Arnold, I find it my duty to do this thing, to reassess, to uh, readjust, to bring about this revolution. He brought about this revolution in critical appreciation. He brought about a complete revolution in the theory of criticism, starting from Plato till the Victorian age. The man mein jitne bhi critics aayenge, un sab ko revolutionize kar diya. Jista jo unka kaam tha, jista unho ne literature ko assess kiya tha, T.S. Eliot revolutionized the entire idea. Usne jis jis ne jis jis kaam ko analyze kiya tha, T.S. Eliot ne usko dubai analyze kiya. He wrote a number of essays. Uske essays collected form bhi publish hoote hain. لیکن ان ایسیز میں سب میں ان کی نا تین طرح کے آپ ڈیویجن کر سکتے ہیں کچھ ہیں جو کہ کچھ آئیڈیاز پر لکھے گئے ہیں کچھ ہیں جو ریلیجن اور سوشل لاجیکل آسپیکٹس پر لکھے گئے ہیں کچھ ہیں جو پرنسپلز کو ڈیفائن کر رہے ہیں کچھ ہیں جو لوگوں کے پویٹری یا ان کے کاموں پر لکھے گئے ہیں ٹھیک ہے سو ان سارے ایسیز کی کلیکشنز آویلیبل ہیں اور ان سارے ایسیز کو آپ یہ اتنی clear cut, it's not a fine division that you can say that yes, very clearly you can define it in three categories but it's like that there are some essays which are full of three categories and some essays which are in one category and some essays which are two things are discussed so it's not that clear distinction between his work but generally speaking this is what he has been doing T.S. Eliot's literary career started almost you know with this essay tradition and individual talent okay and he uh, loomed over the critical uh, scene, uh, critical scene of literature uh, for almost 50 years so he was uh, from this American humanist tradition okay he followed he was inspired by it initially it's a humanist tradition Tina ye romantics can be against the or you realists can be against the it made a it made the it, it made a turn towards the classicism again okay they believed that things have to be assessed according to the standards set by the ancient according to the standards set by the poets of the Europe. Eliot stood against the romantics. He did not believe in them. He found them very fragmentary. He found them immature. He found them uh, chaotic. He believed that people have to believe in uh, a sort of um, a sort of set of principles, rules which would give uh, a sort of certain order, certain harmony, certain sense uh, to literature. For this purpose, he believed that things have to be compared towards the, on the scale of the ancient writers. He uh, was uh, quite well renowned in the literary scene, you know, and he was given this um, uh, literature's uh, Nobel Prize in 1948. He was also given this Order of Merit, and he has written a lot of essays, uh, but it, they're just essays and articles. It's not a single book that you can say that Eliot has written. It is it is Eliot's influence that has brought to favor Dryden, Dante, some of the lesser known Elizabethan poets, and he's the one who has, you know, put the romantics in their graves for good. So, in order to discuss Eliot, we have to keep in mind that this is the poet who is following the tradition of Matthew Arnold. Okay? 
Number one, like Matthew Arnold, he believes that we have to return to the classics. Okay? Number two, like Matthew Arnold, he believed that things have to have a certain principle. There has to be a set of rules to be followed. Okay? But unlike uh, uh, Matthew Arnold, the difference between him and Matthew Arnold is that there's a difference in the way they would treat past. Matthew Arnold stick to it. Okay? Usne kaha ki hume past ko chipak jana chahiye aur hume past se writers ko leke aur unki unke kamo ko leke unko analyze karna chahiye har vakat. Lekin ye jo tha jisko hum kehte T.S. Eliot jo tha he treated past differently. He said that past has to present but the present has to be present as well. So that is what we're going to discuss in his essay on individual uh, tradition and individual talent. So let's start. T.S. Eliot was a great poet and a critic of modern age. He had declared himself a classist in literature, an Anglo-Catholic in religion, and a royalist. So he is traditionalist completely. Look, you have heard this love that he is a traditionalist and he is a liberal and he is a conventionist and stuff like that. T.S. Eliot, who is in the modern era, in the 20th century, is considered a modern poet. But his approach was traditionalist. Traditionalist in everything. He was a Catholic. ठीक है दो एन एंग्लो कैथलिक इंग्लैंड वाले जो चर्च था जिसको आप कहते हैं एंग्लिकन चर्च जो होता है उसमें जो कैथलिक ब्रांच थी उसकी ही वाज एंग्लो कैथलिक ही वाज ट्रेडिशनलिस्ट इन रिटर्चर एंड ही वाज रॉयलिस्ट ही स्टिक टू द मुनाकी he believed in the monarchy. जब सारी दुनिया में एक फ्रेवर चल रहा है डेमोक्रेसी की फेवर में, he was among the traditionalists who would stick for the royalty. तो उसकी पूरी पर्सनालिटी का अगर आप ट्रेड देखें तो ये है ही क्लासिसम की तरफ, कन्वेंशन की तरफ. He was not a liberal. Somehow he was one of the few, one of the people who believed in you know things remaining in their proper way. He did not believe in experimenting, though he did experiment in his poetry because of this influence. Of Azra Pound and Hume. Usne um, Hume ki tarah imagery, apne imagism, bhoat zada use ke imagism. Do came from Azra Pound. Maybe he didn't believe it in him in himself, because us pe Azra Pound ka chakha sa influence tha. To uski poetry mein hume imagism, imagism bhoat zada nazar aata hai. But he was a traditionalist at heart. He believed in the traditional poetry, the classical poetry. He believed in every form of literature had to be traditional. He wrote in his essay on Matthew Arnold. From time to time, every hundred years or so, it is desirable that some critic should appear to review the past of literature and set the past of the poets and the poems in a new order. The task is but of readjustment. He, um, Matthew Arnold is rightly considered his predecessor. So he says that every hundred years or so, there has to be, you know, a person who would come and who would put things uh, in the right order. Every hundred years or so, there should be a critic. And the critic, uh, what's, what's the uh, point of that critic coming? He would come to analyze things. He would come to put things in the proper order, to review things again. Okay? Every hundred years of, uh, or so, the literature of the past has to be reviewed because of whatever has happened in during that hundred years, sociologically, uh, psychologically, uh, financially, to the mankind. Jo kuch bhi hota raha hai, usse uska mind aur tarah ka ho jayega, thik hai? Insaan evolve ho raha hai. Ek so saal mein insaan ka thought process, uski conditions, uski living conditions, uski society, bohat zada develop ho jati hai. Develop nahi hoye, deteriorate bhi agar ho rahi hai, to bhi. Kuch na kuch farak zarur aa raha hai. So that context is on the basis of every 100 years, 100 years, 100 years, 50 years, 60 years, there is such a change that all of what you have done about the past, the past literature, the ideas you have made, formed, you have to review them. So he says that this is necessary, that after every 100 years or so, there should be a person who would come and who would review the past literature, who would review the past literature and who would re-analyze the past literature. And he says that this is necessary, that after every 100 years or so, there should be a person who would come and who would review the past literature, and who would re-form the ideas about how things were and how which poet should be at the highest pedestal, which should be the lowest pedestal, which work should be given more importance than the work that has been previously ignored. Okay? So this is a process according to uh, T. S. Eliot of readjustment, readjusting, reshuffle them, okay? put things um, in a different order uh, because uh, you, are, you have reviewed them and you have found them, uh, you found some lacking uh, holes in it as well. Eliot has almost accomplished a revolution in critical taste. He has compelled us to reconsider and reassess the whole critical theory from Plato to Victorian era. 
His critical achievements have been tremendous. Uh, he has influenced the critical scene for over 50 years and he is considered a revolutionary in the uh, history of criticism. Why? We don't know because he's a classic, he's a traditionalist, he, has give, he hasn't given you a very new idea or something. Kuch uska jo revolutionary aspect hai, uski personality ka, usko hum pinpoint nahi kar sakte somehow. Lekin he has, is, he has, and everyone agrees with that, that he has accomplished a revolution in the literary scene, in the critical scene. Usne critical taste ko completely change kar diya tha. Usne critical taste ko, uh, critical taste ko bhoja da develop kar diya tha, bhoja da refine kar diya tha. Aur yehi uske khal mein critic ki duty thi. Ek critic ki job hi yeh hai ki wo critical taste ko refine kare, usko polish kare, usko itna achha bana de, ke in, jo log hain, jo readers हैं उनको critics की help की जरूरत ना पड़े critic का काम taste को improve करना है appreciation की ability को increase करना enhance करना है he has compelled us to reconsider and reassess he has compelled us the readers to re to reassess to rethink to reanalyze whatever we have thought about literature previously usne hame dobara sochne ko kaha usne hame kaha ki think about the things that you have formed an idea about already if you have thought about milton's paradise lost and you have ideas about milton's paradise lost please think about it again please think and form your own ideas form your new ideas we have to reconsider whether we have been giving due importance to a piece of literature which we have been ignoring pre previously. Should we uh, give it a, a higher rank in the uh, you know order in the hierarchy of literature? If this poet has, uh, if this poet ha or this writer has been ignored, this novelist has been ignored previously, shouldn't he be given a uh, you know a higher rank, a higher status? Shouldn't he be recognized now? Please reconsider. Please reassess. So Plato se leke Victorian era tak usne sare chizon ko reassess kiya hai, sare chizon ko. Uh, 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 reanalyze ke it's not ke usne ek ek poet ko discuss kiya hai usne ek general theory di hai aur us general theory ki base pe hamari sari cheeze jo hai automatically reassess ho rahi hai sari cheeze automatically dobara consider honge sari cheezon ke bare mein hamare view points change ho gaye hain his critical achievements have been tremendous because he has been able to carry out this revolution the theory that he has given was accepted so readily that people started reconsidering people starting re started reassessing ideas change literature things that were considered important once upon a time were not important anywhere isne uh, romantics ko he buried them and he you know he gave importance to some of the poets which were not considered important before dante ko koi nahi puch raha tha dryden ko koi nahi puch raha tha uh, some of the elizabethan lesser known poets unki koi importance nahi thi it was this theory that he gave and when people started analyzing literature on the basis of this theory keeping that theory in mind these people these lesser known poets these people who have not been given the due they came to the limelight so many of the poets that we know nowadays some of the poets that we you know knowledge as great classics uh, or their uh, uh, or their fame and or the or the limelight they share to uh, Eliot. Iska essay jo humne parna hai that is a uh, tradition and talent. Is essay mein kya hai? In this essay, Eliot discusses some vital problems with literature in a sustained manner. He has uh, first of all identified a few problems in literature and then he discussed them in a sustained manner, continued manner and he has contained the problem. He has contained the problem, identified the problem and then he discusses it. The idea of tradition in German to both liter literary tradition and literary criticism, he challenges um, uh, the notion that a poet should be traced in proportion to his originality. He says that the idea of tradition is germane to both literary creation and literary criticism. Okay? Generally believe ye kya jata hai ki jab aap tradition ko follow karte hai, when your work is tradition and when you're being a literary critic, Okay, traditional literary critic, you're considered uh, non-creative, you're not considered very original. He challenges this notion. He challenges this very notion that you have to be original in order to, um, uh, you know, in order to be uh, a poet, a good poet or a creative artist. So he says, general belief, hai na, ki agar aapne, you have to show your creativity, if you have to show how original you are, you have to create something new. He says that you could be original and you could be great and you could be creative at the same time while you're following tradition. So following tradition both in the process of creativity and in literary criticism for T.S. Eliot was not something to be looked down upon. For him following tradition was the base. It was the basis of good literature. For him good literature was created only when tradition was followed. Tradition uske khayal mein kya hai? We'll find out. 
Apart from tradition, a poet is mere phantom. If he is not following the tradition, he is nothing but a ghost. He has to follow tradition in order to be, in order to have substance, in order to have weight, in order to have mass, in order to have volume. Varna wo khali hawa hai. Agar wo, agar wo tradition ko follow nahi karta. For him, tradition is so important that a poet in itself has no weightage unless and until he is following tradition. He cannot be understood unless and until he follows tradition. He has to follow tradition. He has to go a certain way. If he has some background, if he has some context, only then he would be understood. A context is important for the poet to understand, uh, to make people understand what he's trying to say. If he can, if he has a frame of reference, then the frame of reference would be um, very important for him to uh, convey what the point, the point he's trying to convey. He must therefore flow in the main current of literature. He must therefore flow in the main current of literature and not find a stream of his own. He should stay in the mainstream. He should flow with the rest of the uh, uh, creative artist. There is no need to create a nook of your own. There is no need to find uh, a new path in the jungle. The Kenji generally believed that if you are different, if you are different, then you are original, then you are different. Kare. But he believes that this was not the case. This is now how it is to, and this is now how it's to be done. He believed that things have to be done in the proper way, in the traditional way. A poet without tradition, without following tradition, has no sense whatsoever. He would not make sense to anyone. It's the tradition that makes people understand the poet. It's the the tradition that lets the poet convey what he wants to say. He has to stay with the rest of the world. He has to stay with the herd. Generally, it is considered a very bad thing for people to, you know, follow the herd in the form of a group. It's not considered a good thing. Eliot is saying that you have to be a part of the herd for the herd to understand you. You have to be, you know, there for the people who have been writing literature in a certain way have been successful, people have been able to understand them, people have been able to appreciate them. So why differ from their uh, tradition? Why be different? You have to stick to what they have been doing. You'll only have substance only and only when you stick to it. So tradition does not mean a blind or timid adherence to the success of former generation. It does not mean that you have to blindly follow what they have been doing. Um, uh, like if, you know, the former generation has been romantics and is, if the tradition is to be a romantic, you do not have to follow it blindly and sticking to it just because they have been written in a they have been writing poetry in the form of a, um, uh, in the form of a stanza or if they have been writing sonnets no it doesn't mean that that you have to write sonnets just because the predecessor the previous generation who has been so gloriously successful you have to follow them no that is not necessary at all you can deviate from it but it does not mean that you have to violate all the forms and you have to violate all the principles and bounds it involves in the first place historical sense which may call merely indispensable to anyone who would continue to be a poet beyond his 25th year. Acha, uh, there's this age factor. Ye pehli dafa ye baat aayi hai. Criticism humara almost khatam hone wale. And he says that there is an age factor involved as well. If you are a poet, even after you are 25 years old, it means that you are serious about it. Okay? If you continue to be a poet, then you, are, then you have a natural disposition for it. But because you are emotional, because you are unstable, because you might be romantically involved, Everyone does poetry, but if it continues after that, even after you have got a sound, uh, logical, reasonable mind, then you can call yourself a poet. Okay? So he says that it involves tradition, it involves in the first place the historical sense. You have to have an historical sense. Which tradition was important enough? Which tradition is important enough to be followed? Which we may call merely indispensable to anyone. This is important. The historical sense is important to anyone, anyone who continue or who would want to continue to be a poet after 25 years of age. Uh, 25 years of age, you uh, fashion, ko follow karte hai, trend. Ko follow karte hai. Uske baad, if you want to continue to do something, you follow the traditional route. But just you sow your wild oats. Okay? You do the, do, do the experimental things. But after 25, you want to do the stable uh, thing that the rest of the world is doing. Okay? This common is the common pattern. That you have to do this for 24 years. In Pakistan, it's a lot more than that. But in the country, we have to do under pressure. Ko le aate and we want them to you know, have a proper life and get settled and get good education and stuff like that. But in those countries, people, they are they 
experiment with their, with their lives. They try to find out themselves. So f for, for anyone who's serious about being a poet, even after they have sown their wild oats, it is important for them to have this historical sense. Historical sense ka kya matlab? You have to be aware of how important uh, a certain tradition or a certain poet which, whom you wish to follow, who inspires you, was uh, how important he was, he was, or his work was, his tradition was, in the development of literature during that time period. Uska overall influence kya tha? How universal was that tradition? You need to know that. If you know that, then you can follow that tradition. If the tradition has survived the test of time, then you can follow that tradition very easily. And the historical sense involves a perception of the pastness of the past, but of its presence as well. It's not a historical sense jo hogi, ये आपको क्या बताएगी ये आपको बताएगी कि एक चीज जो पास्ट में भी इम्पोर्टेंस थी ठीक है पास्ट की पास्ट इनस के बारे में बताएगी इनके पास्ट का जो इम्पोर्टेंस थी पास्ट की जो चीज जिसको आप फॉलो करें जिस ट्रेडिशन को फॉलो करें उसकी जो पास्ट में इम्पोर्टेंस थी बल्कि जो उसकी प्रेजेंस में भी इम्पोर्टेंस है हैज इट कॉन्टिन्यूड फ्रॉम पास टू प्रेजेंस द हिस्टोरिकल सेंस कंपेल्स अ मैन टू राइड विद नॉट मेरली इज ओन जनरेशन इन स्पोन्स his own generation would be a part of his personality okay because it would be a group of his peers it would be the society in which he grows up it would be the people who influence his thought his actions his fashions and his uh, a way of life his way of living of course you can't ignore that part of it his generation is going to stay there he's going to uh, influence his writing his poetry his uh, his painting whatever but with the feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe, from Homer and within it, the whole literature of his own country has a simultaneous existence. He has to believe that. Ki there is this whole literature, a, a mass of literature, a, a complete bulk of literature, which was written in Europe. Okay? Us literature can this map Homer could be included, so, classics could be included, star chance the whole literature. Apne Homer could be included chaos can there. Uh, is sari bulk can there, apki apne mulka bek literature hai, take a usko bi apne consider can there. So, uh, the historical sense jo hai, it's, it's going to make you form a union, it's going to compel you to write not uh, under the influence of your own generation, of your present, but also under the influence of this bulk of great literature that has been written so far in the world. These literature, they exist simultaneously at the same time and composes a simultaneous order. There's a certain order in that literature. There's a certain literary movement that follows throughout time. Okay? It is the historical sense which makes a writer traditional. You have to know which thing was historically important which thing um, can make you uh, a universally acceptable writer. There is, uh, there is something common between Homer and Dante and Milton. You can find out the stuff. You can pinpoint the facts that are common between these writers. And when you find out these facts, when you find out these uh, points that were, that were the, uh, the things, the elements that are common between Homer, Dante and Milton, you'll be able to understand what tradition is. You'll be able to understand what he's expecting of you here. He sings the historical sense. It involves a perception of the pastness of the past and the pet of its presence as well. It's not only the pastness of the tradition, but it's also the presence of the tradition, how it is present in the present. And the historical sense would allow you to write not under the influence of your own generation, of your present, of the present time, but it will tell you, uh, but it will make you realize that this is this whole literature of Europe, along with the literature of your own country, which exists at the same time, and which exists at the, under the same kind of order. There is a certain order to it. And it is the historical sense which is going to make you follow tradition. It is a historical sense which tells you to write traditionally. Yaapki historical sense, your sense of assessing how important historically a piece of literature is, how universal that piece of literature is. Or uske against per aap apne jo modern literature usko compare karte hain. Eliot is attacking the romantic cut of personality. He's against it, clearly. Arnold to Pitt was a guilty here because he was a, a romantic poet himself. But Eliot has no such uh, inhibitions. He's completely against it. The business of poet is not to find new emotions. They came a traditionalist hai, who kehta hai, emotions nahi nahi ho sakte. Emotions wohi hai jo already exist kar rahe hai. Aap usko nahi emotions mein convert nahi kar sakte. But to use ordinary ones and in working them up into poetry to express feelings which are not in actual emotions at all. 
this is the job of poetry not to create new emotions not to find new emotions poetry kaam ye nahi hai ki wo new new emotions invent kare ya discover kare balki wo ordinary emotions ko lega ordinary cheezon ko lega uske andar se aise emotions create kare ki jo actually present nahi the wahan pe it is his job to create emotions that were not present there एक आम सी चीज़ है उसको क्रिएट करेगा उसको रिप्रोड्यूस करेगा उसको इमिटेट करेगा इन ऑर्डर टू क्रिएट इमोशन दैट वर नॉट एक्चुअली देयर ईल इट इज अटैकिंग रोमांटिक कट ऑफ पर्सनैलिटी द बिजनेस ऑफ पोएट इज नॉट टू फाइंड न्यू इमोशंस यू डोंट हैव टू इन्वेंट एंड यू डो नॉट हैव टू फाइंड न्यू इमोशंस बट टू यूज ऑर्डनरी वंस लाइक हैप्पीनेस और सैडनेस और यू नो जेलसी और बिटरनेस और सारनेस एंड इन वर्किंग दैम अप इन टू पोइट्री एंड यूजिंग दीज ऑर्डनरी इमोशंस एंड इन ट्वाइन दैम इन यू पोइट्री वट एवर यू राइटिंग टू कन्वर्ट दैम इन टू यू पोइट्री टू कम्बाइन दैम इन सच अ वे टू एक्सप्रेस फीलिंग्स दीज इमोशंस आई यूज इन यू पोइट्री टू एक्सप्रेस फीलिंग्स विच आर नॉट इन एक्चुअल इमोशंस ऐसी फीलिंग्स अराउज करेगा जो आम तौर पर जो इन इमोशंस में नहीं होती ठीक है वो यहाँ पे क्रिएटिविटी उसके इन्वॉल्व होगी उसकी क्रिएटिविटी नए इमोशंस को डिस्कवर करने में या नए इमोशंस को बनाने में इन्वॉल्व नहीं है उसकी क्रिएटिविटी उन फीलिंग्स को ढूंढने में उन फीलिंग्स को इज जॉब इज टू गिव राइज टू दोज पर्टिकुलर फीलिंग्स जो आमतौर पर उन इमोशंस के साथ एसोसिएट नहीं होती उन इमोशंस में नहीं होती वो ऑर्डनरी इमोशंस जो उसने अपनी पोइट्री में एक्सप्रेस किए हैं दे शुड गिव राइज टू सर्टन फीलिंग्स विच आर नॉट एक्चुअली प्रेजेंट इन दोज इमोशंस and emotions which he has never experienced will serve the purpose as well as those familiar to him even if he has not served those as uh, experienced those emotions even if he has not undergone that particular uh, trauma in his life or the particular tragedy or the particular form of happiness in his life it's not important they would serve the same purpose as the emotions whom he understands so it is not the emotions that are important it is how you have presented those emotions in your poetry how you work them up as he puts it how you entwine them how you knit them in a fabric that is important whether you have undergone that emotion or you have not undergone that emotion yahan pe words with ye romantics to criticize kar rahe hain na jo keh rahe hain ki you have to undergo that emotion he says that there is no need to undergo that emotion there is no need to find new emotion that's not the job of a poet that's not how he should be what he should be credited for he his job is to use the existing emotions and to work them up in the poetry in such a way that it give rise to feelings which are not present in the actual emotions he also says that it is not the emotions that the poet has experienced it is not necessary that emotions are there which and which have not been experienced by the poet and it is not necessary for the emotions to be present which were experienced by the poet it doesn't matter at all whether the emotions were experienced by the poet or whether they were not experienced by the poet it it is irrelevant for uh, eliot he does not accept words with theory of emotions recollected in tranquility there he finds neither emotion <laughs> nor recollection nor tranquility he is being extremely ruled to wordsworth he says that i don't find any emotions in his poetry i don't find any recollection in that poetry and i don't find any tranquility in the poetry so he completely overwrites uh, his poetry because you know in the later years people would agree with uh, eliot because words were totally lost his inspiration whatever he was writing in the last years of his life was completely inspired and it lacked taste and it lacked substance so if his theory of poetry was right it would have gone on theek hai uski creativity ka jo stream tha jo chashma tha wo khush na hota lekin kyunki wo khush ho gaya isliye hame eliot ki baat manni pad rahi hai aur hum isse agree karenge ke wordsworth ki theory of poetry was not much valid because uh, he believed in emotions which were powerful and there's overflow of it and that would be recollected in tranquility but eliot says ki he does not believe in that for him emotions are always there and they're very ordinary it's not the emotions that are important it's the way they are represented which would, which is important it's the way of presentation of those emotions which would give rise to the feelings koi process of emotions of flow of emotions or recollection of emotions or tranquility is tarah ki koi cheez nahi hai he vehemently attacks the romantic theory of poetry in these lines these are his lines and he's very vehement when we say vehement he means he's very very harsh 
he is leaving them no space. He's not giving them a benefit of doubt. And uh, he's not, you know, considering the fact that they were believed by a great number of people for a great number of time, a uh, great many years. So he says that poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from personality. But, of course, those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from those things. Progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice, continual extinction of personality. The poet's personality is a mere medium, a catalyst which makes it possible for diverse emotions and feelings to be fused organically in a poem. This is what he thinks. Poetry is not a turning loose of emotions. It's not an overflow of powerful feelings. It's, a it's not a turning loose of emotions. emotions But an escape from personality. Poetry for Eliot is an escape from personality. You have to be, you have to let go of your personality. You have to ignore your personality. You have to make your personality extinct. You have to, you know, bombard it. You have to crush it, your personality. It should not be there in the poetry. But of course, those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things. Uh, he's being very harsh here. He says that these romantics, they, they had no personality and they had no emotion. Had they had any personality or emotions, they would have found that it is, it is very difficult to escape them. And uh, personality and emotions, they're so overbearing a thing that you do want to escape it. That is why you go into poetry. Progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice. If you are progressing as an artist, if you're developing as an artist, you're continuously sacrificing yourself, your personality. You're continuously extinct, extinction, you're continually extinction of personality. Hai, continuous um, death of personality. Hai. Death of personality means that it's not that your personality is finished. It means that your personality will be removed. Your self 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 will be वो अपनी पर्सनालिटी को इंपॉर्टेंट रखेगा अपनी सेल्फ को इंपॉर्टेंट रखेगा तो क्रिएटिव प्रोसेस जो है वो उस तरह पावरफुली ग्रो uh, नहीं करेगा उस तरह पावरफुली इवॉल्व नहीं होगा एस्केप है पर्सनालिटी से और इमोशन से पोएट्री इज एन एस्केप फ्रॉम द पर्सनालिटी एंड द एंड इमोशन तो ये तो बिल्कुल रोमांटिक्स की ऑपोजिट वाली बात होगी ना उसके लिए तो पर्सन भी इंपॉर्टेंट था और उनके लिए तो इमोशंस भी इंपॉर्टेंट थे वो कहता है ईलिट कहता है कि रोमांटिक्स आर रॉन्ग है पोइट्री इज बट एन एस्केप फ्रॉम द पर्सनालिटी एंड फ्रॉम द इमोशंस इट इज अ प्रोसेस इट्स अ प्रोग्रेस ऑफ इट्स अ प्रोसेस ऑफ एक्सटिंगशन ऑफ पर्सनैलिटी इट्स अ प्रोसेस ऑफ सेक्रीफाइस सेल्फ सेक्रीफाइस Poet ki personality is not important. It is just a medium. It is just a catalyst. This catalyst's work is that he fuses many diverse emotions and many feelings organically. He acts. In that process, he is just a process. He is just triggering this process. His personality is the only work. His personality in this process of, of amalgamation of, poet, of emotions and feelings, uh, putting them together, he enhances it. He fastens it. He makes it fast. ये पोइट का काम है जो सब कुछ रोमांटिक्स एसोसिएट करते हैं पोइट से और पोइट्री से और इमोशंस से और फीलिंग्स से एलियट के ख्याल में वो सब कुछ टू बी वेरी पोलाइट बकवास है एलियट्स आइडिया ऑफ ट्रेडिशन होल्ड्स गुड फॉर द लिटरी क्रिटिक आल्सो नो पोएट नो आर्टिस्ट ऑफ एनी आर्ट हैज इस कम्प्लीट मीनिंग लोन ठीक है ये वही बात है कि से कि जैसे लिटरी आर्टिस्ट के लिए ट्रेडिशन इम्पॉर्टेंट है ऐसे लिटरी क्रिटिक्स के लिए भी ट्रेडिशन इम्पॉर्टेंट है कोई भी क्रिटिक कोई भी ट्रेडिशन जो है कोई भी क्रिटिक जो है वो ट्रेडिशन के बगैर किसी भी चीज़ को समझ नहीं सकता ही हैज़ टू हैव अ फ्रेम ऑफ रेफरेंस ही हैज़ टू हैव अ यू नो टर्निंग पॉइंट समथिंग दैट ही कैन यू नो टर्न बैक टू समथिंग दैट ही कैन रेफर टू ही हैज़ टू हैव अ फ्रेम वर्क ही हैज़ टू हैव अ रेफरेंस पॉइंट सो उस रेफरेंस पॉइंट के लिए वो सिर्फ आर्टिस्ट के लिए जरूरी नहीं है बल्कि वो लिटरी क्रिटिक के लिए भी जरूरी है नो आर्टिस्ट ऑफ एनो पोएट नो आर्टिस्ट ऑफ एनी आर्ट हैज इस कंप्लीट मीनिंग अलोन किसी भी आर्टिस्ट को समझने के लिए किसी भी पोएट को समझने के लिए किसी भी नॉवलिस्ट को समझने के लिए आपको उसके कंटेम्प्रीज को पढ़ना पड़ता है आपको उसके कंटेम्प्रीज के एटलीस्ट सेंस जरूर लेने पड़ते हैं आपको उस एज में जिसमें वो एग्जिस्ट कर रहा होता है उस एज को समझना पड़ता है उसकी फाइनेंशियल इकोनॉमिकल सिचुएशन को समझना पड़ता है उस एज की जो सोशियोलॉजिकल फैक्टर्स हैं उनको समझना पड़ता है जो भी उनकी पोलिटिकल सिचुएशन थी उसको समझना पड़ता है कोई भी चीज़ अकेले एग्जिस्ट नहीं करती और किसी भी चीज़ का मतलब अकेले समझ नहीं आ सकता
His significance, his appreciation is the appreciation of his relations to the dead poets and the artist. His significance, the poet's significance, and his appreciation is the appreciation of his relation to the dead poets and the artist. जिस तरह भी क्रिटिक जो है वो किसी भी चीज़ को समझेगा किसी भी चीज़ को अप्रिशिएट करेगा किसी भी चीज़ को क्रिटिकली अप्रिशिएट करेगा तो उसकी अप्रिसिएशन एक्चुअली उसकी अप्रिसिएशन है उन जो उसकी एसोसिएशन है डेड पोइट्स के साथ एंशियट पोइट्स के साथ या एंशियट आर्टिस्ट के साथ उसकी एसोसिएशन उनके साथ अफेक्ट करेगी उसकी अप्रिसिएशन को उसकी अप्रिसिएशन ऑफ द डेड पोइट्स ऑफ द एंशियट पोइट्स इज गोइंग टू अफेक्ट हिज अप्रिसिएशन वट एवर द प्रेजेंट सब्जेक्ट ऑफ एनालिसिस इज so you cannot value him alone you must set him for a contrast and comparison for criticism if you want to understand a poet if you want to understand an artist you have to understand his appreciation of the artist uh, that have been previously um, you know the ancients for that matter so uh, for him in order to understand him in order to understand the present question of analysis jo bhi aapka present um, uh, uh, जिसको भी आप प्रेजेंटली एनालाइज कर रहे हैं जिसको क्रिटिकल एनालाइज कर रहे हैं उसको समझने के लिए आपको उसको उन इन कंट्रास्ट रखना पड़ेगा उसको इन कंपैरिजन रखना पड़ेगा विद द प्रीवियस और विद द क्रिटिक्स और विद द एंशियंस दिस इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ स्टैटिक्स नॉट मेली हिस्टोरिकल क्रिटिसिज्म दिस इज नॉट मेली हिस्टोरिकल क्रिटिसिज्म हमने बिल्कुल शुरू में पहले लेक्चर में पढ़ा था कि हिस्टोरिकल क्रिटिसिज्म क्या होता है हिस्टोरिकल क्रिटिसिज्म होता है कि यू हैव टू एनालाइज अ राइटर नॉट ओनली विद रेफरेंस टू द टाइम पीरियड बट आल्सो विद रेफरेंस टू द लाइफ एंड द हिस्ट्री ऑफ द राइटर एंड हिज कंटेम्प्रेरीज ये इलिट कहते हैं कि इस खाली लिटरी हिस्ट्री हिस्टोरिकल क्रिटिसिज्म नहीं है बल्कि ये एक पॉइंट ऑफ स्थैटिक है जो थेरी ऑफ स्थैटिक है थेरी ऑफ स्थैटिक इज लाइक यू नो डिफाइनिंग हाउ टू एप्रिशिएट समथिंग तो उस केस में इलिट कहता है कि ट्रेडिशन इट होल्ड गुड फॉर द लिटरी क्रिटिक एज वेल फॉर द लिटरी आर्टिस्ट सो इन ऑर्डर टू अंडरस्टैंड अ पोएट और एन आर्टिस्ट और अ नॉवलिस्ट और अ प्ले राइट यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड हिज एप्रिसिएशन ऑफ द रेस्ट ऑफ दिज एप्रिसिएशन ऑफ द रेस्ट ऑफ द वर्क दैट हैव बीन डन बाई द एंशियंट कि वो जो राइटर है उसने एंशियंट्स को कैसे अप्रिशिएट किया और आपने उनके रेफरेंस से इस राइटर को असेस करना है कोई भी राइटर अकेला नहीं असेस हो सकता यू हैव टू हैव द बैकग्राउंड विद यू हैव टू असेस हिज यू हैव टू understand his contemporaries you have to understand his time period you have to understand all the political and uh, you know sociological and psychological situations going on there so you have to consider his relation the poet's relation the poet you're trying to analyze his relation to the dead poets and the dead artists that is the ancients उनके साथ उसकी क्या एसोसिएशन है वो उनको कैसे इवेल्यूएट करे वो उनको अपने काम में कैसे इनकॉपरेट कर रहा है तो ये चीज भी इंपॉर्टेंट है सो यू कैन नॉट वैल्यू ह्यूमन लोन इन ऑर्डर टू एनालाइज हिम यू हैव टू हैव अ स्टैंडर्ड एंड द स्टैंडर्ड वुड कम फ्रॉम द एंशियंस दिस कंपेयरिंग or analyzing something not as, as something alone or something you know isolated but in reference to other things it's a principle of static and not merely historical criticism the necessity that he shall conform that he shall cohere is not one sided what happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it every time something new is created it changes whatever was thought or written about everything that was written before it theek okay? hai एक वर्क ऑफ आर्ट नई क्रिएशन के बाद पिछली सारी चीज़ों के बारे में एटीट्यूड चेंज जाते हैं क्योंकि आप पिछली सारी चीज़ों के साथ आप उसको भी ले आते हैं वो सारी चीज़ें इकट्ठी हो जाती हैं फिर एक नई चीज़ें क्रिएट होने से बाकी सारी चीज़ें भी अफेक्ट होती हैं जो पहले लिखी जा चुकी हैं तो इसी तरह जो नई चीज़ है वो भी उन सारी चीज़ों से अफेक्ट होती है जो पहले लिखी जा चुकी होती हैं सो इट इज़ द नेसेसरी दैट ही शेल कन्फर्म दैट ही शेल कोहेर इट्स नॉट वन साइडेड इट्स नॉट वन साइडेड दैट ही शुड कन्फर्म टू द things that have been written previously things that have been written by the ancients it is the duty of the poet or it is it is necessary for a poet to conform to the uh, traditional aspect okay he has to conform to whatever has been written he has to you know adhere to something that has been written previously before him usse usko yani ki he has to be like them somehow इन सम फॉर्म किसी न किसी तरह उनसे डिविएट नहीं कर सकते ट्रेडिशनली स्पीकिंग लेकिन ये वन साइडेड चीज़ नहीं है जैसे ही कोई वर्क ऑफ आर्ट क्रिएट होता है कोई नई चीज़ लिखी जाती है कोई नई पोइम लिखी जाती है तो वो नई पोइम भी पीछे से लिखी हुई सारी चीज़ों को अफेक्ट कर देती है उन सारी चीज़ों के बारे में भी एटीट्यूड चेंज हो जाता है क्योंकि एक नई चीज़ आ जाती है परस्पेक्टिव चेंज हो जाता है 
the existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves, which is modified by the introduction of the new work of art among them. Generally, जो चीजें already exist कर रही हैं, वो एक monument की form है, उनके एक proper order है, एक proper sequence है. जब कोई नई चीज उसके अंदर आती है, तो automatically वो order जो है, वो disorder में convert हो जाता है, और उन चीजों को दोबारा से readjustment की process से गुजरना पड़ता है. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. ठीक है? अब नई कुछ नई नया नहीं लिखा हुआ, तो अगर आप देखें कि glasses एक सात आठ glass एक line में पड़े हैं, ठीक है? वो सात आठ glass proper order में हैं, एक line में हैं, उनमें order है. They don't need to be, you know, do anything about it. लेकिन अगर आपने एक और glass लाके रखना है, तो आपने उसको adjust करना है ना, उन सात glasses के अंदर जगह, तो बस इतनी सी है, जिसमें सात glass लेकिन जैसे ही एक नया ग्लास आया तो दो ग्लास आगे गए और छह ग्लास जो थे वो पीछे हो गए रीएडजस्टमेंट का प्रोसेस हुआ तो खाली जो नई चीज आई उसने अपने आप को कंफर्म करने की कोशिश नहीं की पहले वाले ग्लासेस से बल्कि जो पुराने ग्लास एग्जिस्ट करे थे उन्होंने भी उस नई चीज के हिसाब से अपनी पोजिशन चेंज की उन्होंने भी अपने आप को रीएडजस्ट किया For order to persist after the supervention novelty, the whole existing order must be ever so slightly altered, and so the relation, uh, proportion, values of each work of art towards that whole are readjusted, and this is the conformity between the new and the old. I have already explained this to you. Okay, there is this readjustment process goes on. The new things adjust to the old ones, and the old ones they adjust to the new ones. There is a complete readjustment process in proportion to whatever new has been added to the, uh, to the whatever already exists. The things that exist are. Pro, uh, or previously and they are in a particular order and the order is complete. When something new is created, uh, then something that something new also began, has to conform to this already existing order. But when it comes to that order, there has to be made certain space for it, certain readjustments. So, in this way, the new reference se, baki ki bhi, um, uh, alienation change hoti hai, unki bhi cheeze, unki bhi readjustment hoti hai, aur unki taraf bhi jo values assigned ki jati hai, wo bhi change hoti hai, unki bhi appreciation change ho jati hai. In the process, there is a clear exposition of the impersonal theory of poetry, which has become so closely associated with Eliot. Acha, ये जो process है ना traditional का जिसमें readjustment हो रही है कोई नई चीज़ create होने के बाद, ये Eliot की impersonal theory साथ है, and he's it's very closely associated with Eliot, and it's almost his theory individually. In this essay, we find the exposition of certain principles and theories which never changed radically in the course of time. One cannot overlook the fact that this essay serves as a framework to which many of his future critical essays um, refer. Achha. ये जो इसका ऐसे था इम्पर्सनल थेरी का इसमें इसने कुछ क्रिटिकल प्रिंसिपल्स दिए थे कुछ थेरीज नहीं हैं जो कि उसके फर्दर जो आगे उसने ऐसे लिख रहे थे उनकी guideline thi ya unki base thi. So the concept of tradi tradition basic to Eliot's theory of poetry demands the surrender of poet's subjectivity to an outside authority. Achha. Jo Eliot ki theory hai tradition ki, usme, uh, wo, usme wo kehta hai ki the poet has to surrender to an outside authority. There has to be something outside. Wo hi baat jo hum kar rahe hai, kaafi da fam kar chuke ki there has to be a set of principle jo authority kehlaye ka, thik hai? वो जो सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल है जो फ्रेमवर्क है जो रूल्स हैं वो आउटसाइड फैक्टर है वो पोइट के बाहर है ना वो पोइट के अंदर तो नहीं है ये नहीं कि हर एक सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल डिफरेंट होगा नहीं ये ट्रेडिशनल ट्रेडिशनल जो पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू है वो ये कहता है कि एक ही एक ही सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल होगा एक ही सेट ऑफ रूल्स होगा और सबको उसी को फॉलो करना होगा द पोइट हैज टू सरेंडर टू दैट सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल इन ऑर्डर टू बी अ गुड पोइट इन ऑर्डर टू बी एक्सेप्टेड इन ऑर्डर टू कन्फर्म so the poetry demands, uh, Eliot's theory of poetry demands that the surrender of the poet's subjectivity to an outside authority. Uh, subjectivity is this ability to not, not this objective terse statements, but thoughts basically. Tradition is that outside authority to which the writer as well as the critic have to submit. It's not only the writer that have to submit to tradition, but it's the critic as well. There has to be certain traditional rules for the critic as well. The critic would uh, would accept those points of reference. He would accept ki ha, this is what I accept and these are the things I will analyze or assess a writer on. 
ठीक है ये मेरे रूल्स हैं मैं इन्हीं के बेसिस पे किसी भी राइटर को किसी भी पोइट को असेस करूंगा इसी तरह जो पोइट लिखेगा पोइट्री वो भी इन्हीं रूल्स को फॉलो करेगा इस आउटसाइड अथॉरिटी को फॉलो करेगा कहेगा कि मैंने अगर पोइट्री लिखनी है तो मैंने इन रूल्स को फॉलो करके रखनी है तो जब पोइट और क्रिटिक उन रूल्स पे अग्रीड अपॉन होंगे तो क्रिटिसिज्म जो है इट वुड बिकम समथिंग कंक्रीट इट वुड बी समथिंग टैंजिबल जो फील की जा सकेगी जिसको करना आसान होगा जिसको कैरी आउट करना आसान होगा ये इंसान की पर्सन लाइक्स और डिसलाइक्स पर फिर डिपेंड नहीं करेगी बल्कि और ये पोइट की अपनी लाइक्स और डिसलाइक पर डिपेंड नहीं करेगी बट इट वुड हैव अ कंक्रीट फॉर्म अ सिंपल सेट ऑफ रूल्स दैट बोथ द क्रिटिक एंड द आर्टिस्ट वुड फॉलो The impersonal theory of poetry has two aspects. Okay, number one, it expresses the relation between the poet and the literary tradition, and on the other one hand, and on the other hand, it brings out the relation of the poet with himself in the creation of a work of art. अच्छा, एक चीज impersonal theory में पहली चीज ये relation of the poet and the literary tradition. कि poet literary tradition को कैसे follow करेगा. There has to be a literary tradition, and the poet has to follow it. and on the other hand it brings out the relation of the poet with himself in the creation of the work of art ki poet apne aap se kaise deal karega how would he involve himself in the process of creation of poetry in the process of creation of a work of art so the impersonal theory of art according to eliot would have two things ye jo eliot ne jo impersonal theory of art di usme do cheeze hain jo note karne wali hain jo hame pata honi chahiye ek to ye ke jo poet hai aur uski aur literary tradition ke dimen kya relation hai similarly poet ka apne आपसे क्या रिलेशन होगा अपनी पर्सनालिटी के साथ क्या रिलेशन होगा व्हेन ही इज अंडरगोइंग दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएशन इट हैज बीन द हैबिट ऑफ क्रिटिक्स टू प्रेज अ पोएट फॉर हिज इंडिविजुअल फीचर्स इन हिज पोएट्री ठीक है आमतौर पर क्रिटिक्स यही करते हैं कि जो उसके फीचर्स हैं इंडिविजुअल फीचर्स हैं किसी की इमेजरी अच्छी है किसी के मैटर यूज ऑफ मैटर अच्छा है किसी ने लैंग्वेज बहुत अच्छी यूज की हुई है उन सारी चीजों को प्रेज करते हैं there is importance given to those features in which a poet least resembles others generally it so happens that you appreciate a writer or a poet or an artist if he is different from the others because uh, you know ab jab hum metaphysical se padhe the to unko bhi to yahi fikr thi na they wanted to be original they wanted to do something that has never been done before they wanted to say something that has never been said in a particular way before so नॉवल्टी जो है दैट वॉज ऑलवेज एप्रिशिएटेड बाई क्रिटिक्स कि किसी ने कुछ नया किया किसी ने कुछ डिफरेंट तरीके से किया तो उसको एप्रिशिएट किया जाता था इन अदर वर्ड्स द पोइट इज प्रेज फॉर बींग अन ट्रेडिशनल जनरली ये हमारा एटीट्यूड है एलियट क्या कह रहे हैं दिस अकॉर्डिंग टू एलियट शोज इग्नोरेंस ऑफ लिटरी हेरिटेज दिस शोज कि वो अपनी लिटरी हेरिटेज को अपने विरसे को अपनी अदबी विरसे को इग्नोर कर रहे हैं इसका मतलब है कि दे डोंट अंडरस्टैंड हाउ रिच हाउ ब्यूटिफुल एंड हाउ फुलफिलिंग द लिटरी हेरिटेज इज इफ दे वॉन्ट टू डिविएट फ्रॉम इट इफ दे वॉन्ट टू रन अवे फ्रॉम इट इफ दे वॉन्ट टू स्ट्रे फ्रॉम इट इट मीन्स दैट दे डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड हाउ द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ ट्रेडिशन है दे डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट देव इनहेरिट इन एज लिटरेचर On shedding prejudice, it will be noted that the most original portions of a poet's work are those in which the dead poets, his ancestors, assert the immortality most vigorously. Eliot कह रहे हैं कि अगर आप बायस ना हो अगर आप ये ना सोचें कि you have to be novel in order to, you have to say something new in order to be good, then you'll realize कि जितने poets को process करेंगे जब तक वो ट्रेडिशन को फॉलो करते हैं जब तक वो एंशंट्स को फॉलो करते हैं जब तक वो अपने पीडिस को फॉलो करते हैं तब तक उनकी पोइट्री बहुत खूबसूरत है तब तक उनकी पोइट्री सब्सटैंशियल है तब तक उनकी पोइट्री प्रोफाउंड है और उसमें डेप्थ है एंड जिस 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 पोइट्री में एंशियंट पोइट्स अपने आप को असर्ट करते हैं जिसमें वो नजर आते हैं जिसमें उनकी पोइट्रिक जीनियस नजर आता है जिसमें उनकी कामनेस ब्यूटी एंड ऑब्जेक्टिविटी ऑफ आर्ट नजर आती है दैट पार्ट ऑफ पोइट्री ऑफ एनी पोइट वुड बी वर्थ इट उसके अलावा जो कुछ वो लिखते हैं जहाँ पे वो अपने आप को ओरिजिनल बनाने की कोशिश करते हैं ज्यादा क्रिएटिव होने की कोशिश करते हैं नॉवल्टी लाने की कोशिश करते हैं वो पोइट्री अच्छी पोइट्री नहीं होती Being traditional, however, does not imply blind imitation. It does not mean that you have to follow and write Paradise Lost again. ठीक है? आपने बिल्कुल मिल्टन को अगर traditional follow करें तो इसका मतलब ये नहीं होगा. Tradition is a matter of much wider significance. It cannot be inherited. One has to work hard to acquire it. It involves historical sense, which is the sense of timeless as well as of the temporal together. The sense of time being eternally present, of the existence of the past and the present together, is what makes a writer traditional. Traditionality, kya hai? 
ट्रेडिशनैलिटी ये नहीं है कि आपने एग्जैक्टली exactly कॉपी कर लिया किसी को ट्रेडिशनैलिटी ये है कि आपको ये एहसास हो कि जो पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर आपको पसंद आ रहा है दैट इज़ नॉट ओनली इम्पोर्टेंट इन द पास बट इट इज़ प्रेजेंट इन द प्रेजेंस एज वेल उसकी प्रेजेंस जो है प्रेजेंट में भी उतनी ही मैगनीमस है जितनी पास्ट में थी जितना वो पास्ट में सिग्निफिकेंट था उतना ही वो प्रेजेंट में भी सिग्निफिकेंट है और उसकी जो दोनों चीज़ों की कॉम्बिनेशन है पास्ट और प्रेजेंट की दिस This the development of this historical sense that the past was glorious and the present is glorious in the unification of these two things and the uh, and the realization of this that the past and the present of that piece of work is more the more important that uh, and you know and uh, having this realization and trying to reproduce it in the work is what is going to make a writer traditional. Acha. What is this greatness of past that he uh, talks about all the time? That he says that you have to believe in the greatness of the past and you have to stick to it and realize it. It is necessary to know that Eliot's concept of the importance of past is in the idea of literary tradition is different from Arnold's idea of greatness of past. We discussed it in the beginning. Ki Arnold kis tarah past ko treat karta tha aur Eliot jo karta dono ka tarika different hai. Arnold considered the works of past as a standing reference to which the modern poets should look if they were to make anything of their poetry. ठीक है ना? वो उनके against ही उनको compare भी करता था. Arnold कहता था कि there has to be a certain way. and the poets if they want to make something of themselves if they want to do good if they want to be creative and if they want to be appreciated they have to uh, follow this uh, tradition they, they have to follow uh, the poets of the past the past cannot be seen separately from the present this is what eliot believes they are not two separate things they are part of one big whole it has to be seen in close relationship to the present they keep past led up to present and present uh, is a continuum of the past so these two things they cannot be separated wo ek hi cheez ki do different forms hain wo cheez ek hi hai wo ek hi whole hai wo uski do compartments hain wo different nahi hai ek dusre se the poet with a sense of tradition will neither reject the past nor respect or imitate it indiscriminately जिस पोइट को भी ट्रेडिशन की समझ आ गई है जिस पोइट को भी समझ आ गया कि देर इज़ अ यूनिवर्सैलिटी देर इज़ अ होल अबाउट द इंटायर थिंग ही वुड नॉट डिसरिगार्ड इट एंड ही वुड नॉट इवन इमिटेट इट ही वुड अंडरस्टैंड द यूनिवर्सैलिटी ऑफ इट एंड ही वुड ट्राई टू रिप्रोड्यूस इट इन हिज वर्क ही विल इसमुलेट द पास्ट सो कम्प्लीटली दैट इट बिकम्स अ पार्ट ऑफ हिमसेल्फ ही वुड एब्जॉर्ब इट ठीक है जो आनल्ड का भी एक पॉइंट था कहीं पे बीच में जब वो कहता था कि जो राइटर्स थे जो पोइट्स थे जिन्होंने एंशंस को बहुत ज़्यादा पढ़ा था क्लासिक्स को बहुत ज़्यादा पढ़ा था उनके उनकी जिंदगी को वो जिंदगी को देखते ही एंशंस की तरह से थे सो दिस इज द पॉइंट है यू हैव टू मेक दम अ पार्ट ऑफ यूर सेल्फ द ट्रेडिशन यू हैव टू मेक इट अ पार्ट ऑफ यूर सेल्फ वेन ही वर्क ही विल क्रिएट समथिंग इन विच द पास शुड बी मोडिफाइड बाई द प्रेजेंट एंड द प्रेजेंट विल बी डायरेक्टेड विद द पास पास्ट और प्रेजेंट उसके काम में प्रेजेंट होंगे उसके काम में मौजूद होंगे पास्ट जो है वो मॉडिफाई होके प्रेजेंट में आ जाएगा और जो प्रेजेंट है उसको डायरेक्ट करेगा पास्ट नई फॉर्म होगी चीज़ों की लेकिन वो कम्प्लीटली ब्रोकन अवे फ्रॉम द ट्रेडिशन नहीं होगी उसमें पास्ट भी होगा और उसमें प्रेजेंट भी होगा एन आर्टिस्ट है टू सबमिट अ सब्जेक्ट इज सेल्फ टू द अवेयरनेस ऑफ ट्रेडिशन इन द क्रिएशन ऑफ आर्ट इट बिकम्स नेसेसरी दैट द आर्टिस्ट मेक्स अ कॉन्टीन्यूल सेल्फ सेक्रीफाइस द प्रोसेस ऑफ गेनिंग मेच्योरिटी इन्वॉल्व अ कॉन्टीन्यूल एक्सटेंशन ऑफ पर्सनैलिटी इस प्रोसेस में ही वुड हैव टू लेट हिम सेल्फ गो ही वुड नॉट हैव टू फॉलो दिस पर्सनल इंटरेस्ट ही वुड हैव टू सेक्रीफाइस हिज ओन इंटरेस्ट ही वुड हैव टू हैव दिस इमालगम ऑफ पास्ट एंड प्रेजेंस एंड फॉर दिस ही वुड हैव टू सेक्रीफाइस हिज पर्सनैलिटी फिर इसके इम्पर्सनल थेरी ऑफ आर्ट का जिक्र आया था अभी कि टी एस एलियट बिलीव इन इम्पर्सनल थेरी ऑफ आर्ट वेन ही कम्स टू डिस्कस द रिलेशन ऑफ द पोएम्स टू ऑथर ही इंसिस्ट इन सेपरेटिंग द मैन एंड द पोइट एक्सपीरियंस फ्राम द आर्ट ठीक है वो कह रहा है कि खाली रिलेशन ऑफ द ऑथर टू द पास नहीं देखना बल्कि आपने मैन और पोइट को भी डिफरेंस कर देना है अगर आप आर्ट के प्रोसेस को समझना चाह रहे हैं तो ही सेज द मोर परफेक्ट द आर्टिस्ट द मोर कम्प्लीट सेपरेट इन हेम विल बी द मैन हु सफर्स एंड द माइंड विच क्रिएट्स a poet would be a different person or would be separate from the personality that he has the creativity of the poet uh, would take place in the mind the body of the poet would suffer it would give rise to certain feelings but it is the job of the mind of the poet to create to use the feelings to use the sufferings and create something else agar bahut bada artist hoga jitna bada artist hoga utni zyada iske do cheeze separate uska dimag aur uske physical sense separate honge 
He regards the poet's mind as a medium rather than a personality. It's the mind which is the medium in which poetry is created. He says that the feelings or emotions or visions resulting from the poem is something different from the feeling or emotion or vision in the mind of the poet. They can't just cheese cover suffer kara hai, jo cheese was so chra hai. It would be different from what he has, what is presenting in the poem. There has to be a difference between his own feelings and the feelings that he has created. A poet is great, not because he puts his personality into his work, but because he has a mind in which he, um, a varied feelings enter into new combinations. Uh, his personality is a person's personality. His mind is a poet's mind. And how is his mind a poet's mind? That he feels the feelings that every person feels, the emotions which, which every human being undergoes. He would use the same kind of emotions, similar, simple, ordinary emotions, and create them into different combinations, thus creating poetry. There are two kinds of emotion. One is the emotion of the poet, which is impure and crude. The other is the emotion of the poem, which he calls the significant emotion. Ek wo emotion hai jo poet feel kar. Ek wo cheez hai jo poet feel kar. Aur ek wo emotion hai jo poem ka emotion hai. That is the significant emotion. Wo emotion jo poem ke andar hai, jo wo aapke andar create kar rahi hai. The significant emotion has its life in the poem. Uh, and not in the history of the poet. The emotion of art is impersonal. There is nothing personal involved in the emotion of the art. The uh, emotion that the poem has, uh, the emotion the poem is creating in you, it would be different from the emotion of the poet. It has to have its own individuality. It has to have its, its uh, it should be unbiased, unperturbed, anything related to the poet. It has to have nothing with the poet. It is not the greatness, the intensity of the emotion, the confidence, but the intensity of the artistic process, the pressure, so to speak, under which the fusion takes place that counts. It's the pressure under which the feelings and the emotions, the sufferings of the poet converts into the feelings or emotions of the poem. Impersonal, impersonal emotion may convert. Oh, the fusion, the pressure is very important. Poetry is a conscious art and requires constant effort. Consciously, there has to be a conscious will present. Okay? Sensibility bhi chahiye, but conscious will bhi chahiye. So there's a great deal in writing of poetry, which must be conscious and deliberate. Okay? So you have to follow some principles, some rules bhi follow karne padenge, jo conscious honge or deliberate. Honge. In fact, the bad poet is usually unconscious, where he ought to be conscious, and conscious where he ought to be unconscious. A poet, if he's not a good poet, he would be consistent and conscious and diligent where he ought to be unconscious. He would be feelings ke mein, emotions ke mein, bahut conscious. Hoga. Lekin पे उसको कॉन्शियस होना चाहिए वहां पे वो अनकॉन्शियस होगा बोथ एरर टेंड्स टू मेक द पोएट्री पर्सनल जब वो पर्सनल हो जाएगा तो इंपर्सनालिटी ऑफ इमोशन जो पोएम की होनी चाहिए जो सिग्निफिकेंट इमोशन का इंपर्सनल होना चाहिए वो कॉम्प्रोमाइज हो जाएगा सो दिस इज अबाउट ऑल वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस फर्दर थिंग्स ऑब्जेक्टिव रिलेटिविटी एंड हिज फंक्शन ऑफ क्रिटिक्स एंड अ फ्यू अदर थिंग्स अबाउट टीएस एलियट थैंक यू